Hello everybody. My name is Printed Boxdale. And I hope that you have you enjoying this YouTube channel. Will you please hit the subscribe and like button? And y'all are gonna have a hallelujah good time, but we got many more to come. And let's have a good time together. Lord has done. See what the Lord. See what the Lord Oh, come on and see what the Lord Has he done something? See what the Lord Yeah You, you, you are the account of your Yeah I know what the Lord Oh, come on and see what the Lord Has he done something? See what the Lord You, you, you are the account of your Yeah I know what the Lord has done. Don't you know that He woke me up this morning? See what the Lord. Y'all gotta help me. Do you know that He woke me up this morning? See what the Lord. Do you know that He There's a word in the book of Daniel this morning. And I just want to read it again for the sake of emphasis. I appreciate our brothers this morning and leading us in our service. But Daniel has a word for us, y'all. And I hope and pray that we can all glean something this morning. Prayerfully something to be heard that will be beneficial for your spiritual development. Let's read it again, the first four verses of Daniel, chapter number one. Okay, so now it's the third year in the reign of Jehoiakim. He's the king of Judah. And then came Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem, and he besieged it, took it over, just said, give me your land, give me your people, your cows, your sheep, your ox, your gold, your sir, just give me everything. Verse 2, and the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hands, with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasury house of his God. And the king, Nebuchadnezzar, king, spoke to Ashpenaz, who was the master of the eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel, and the king's seed, and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored, and skillful in all wisdom, and in cunning in knowledge, and understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning in the tongue of the Chaldeans. This morning I want to talk to you from the subject that's simply entitled The Process of Conquering Compromise. We're going to look at four young men that's in a strange land that was influenced to compromise everything that they have learned. But they had a spirit within them so that they could conquer this compromise that they were faced with. Compromise is defined as a settlement of differences by mutual concessions. It's an agreement reached by adjustment of conflicting or opposing claims, principles, etc. by reciprocal modifications of demand. Oftentimes, life is filled with compromises. Our text this morning is about four men, four young men who came to a decisive part in their life. They could either compromise and go with the flow, or they could stand their ground and live for the Lord. The circumstances they faced and the decisions that they made, it set the course of their whole life. Let me say that again. The decisions that these young men made during this time in their life, it set the course for their whole life. Since this incident occurred, the names Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego has stood tall in the names of the great heroes 
of faith. And what of Daniel? Who would have ever heard of Daniel if he would have compromised in the early stages of his life? His name would be unknown to modern man. And we would never have received this wonderful book called Daniel. With that in mind, it will be able to say that these young men, they stood the test. And as a result, we are blessed this morning. Church, we are blessed this morning because of the faith that they stood on. The truth contained in this passage will help us face some serious crossroads in our lives. And my prayer is that we can glean the strength that we need so that we can know the process of conquering compromise. So in verse 1 and 2, we see that Nebuchadnezzar has come to Jerusalem to take over. And notice that the Bible says the Lord gave it to Nebuchadnezzar. See, because Jerusalem was a strongly fortified city. It could not be overthrown unless God allowed it to be overthrown. But notice the text says that the Lord delivered Jehoiakim into their hands. Why? Because Israel was disobedient to God. This was the first deportation of Israel being exiled to Babylonia. This is the first group of people that was taken captive into the hands of the Babylonians and taken into slavery. But notice the Bible says they even took their sacred vessels out of the temple of the Lord and removed it and took it to Shinar. Shinar is a city in Babel. And if you can recall, there was a tower that was built in Babel, known as the Tower of Babel or the Tower of Babel, however you want to pronounce it. They took the golden vessels, the sacred vessels from Jerusalem and took them to Shinar. The Babylonians took it from the temple of God and placed it in the temple of false gods, as if, as if though it was signifying uh, some uh, a trophy of victorious, of being victory. Of being victorious. That's what I was trying to say. When we compromise. When we conform to society. We take this article. We take this earthen vessel. We take this temple. And we place it in the temple of a false god. Which is Satan the devil. When we compromise. We are placed as a trophy on the shelf of Satan the devil. When we use profanity and tell lies and gossip, the devil takes our precious temple and put it in his trophy case. When someone has sexual intercourse with somebody that is not their spouse, the devil takes this article, this earth and treasure, and places it in his trophy case. When one is jealous, when folk get drunk and smoke and do all of these terrible things in the sight of God, the devil takes this beautiful article and places it in his trophy case. When one does not commit their lives to God, after all of the wonderful blessings that he has bestowed upon them, the devil laughs and celebrates because it's another victory and it's another trophy. Church, our bodies are the temple of God. We are precious and valuable. In the sight of God. Don't allow yourself to be a trophy on the devil's shelf. Conquer this, this, this idea of compromise. See, most of the time when you and I compromise our faith, see, we don't understand the magnitude of the problem. During the process of conquering compromise, it is of the utmost importance that we recognize the problem. We got to see this thing coming. And when we are faced with compromising our faith, recognize the problem immediately. These young boys in our text, they saw the major problem that they were facing. And the first major problem that they were facing was a new home. These boys have been brought up in around Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, they were constantly reminded of the great Jehovah God and the importance in their lives. There was the temple and the sacrifice in Jerusalem. The priests and the scribes were teaching. The prophets were preaching the message of Jehovah God. There was the observance of the Sabbath and the holy days and the new moon. They were surrounded by spiritual things in Jerusalem. 
But in this new hall, now they are slaves that have been hauled off to Babylon and now they're surrounded by heathen worship, heathen images, and heathen people. Now, it would have been easy for them to just conform and fit in. It's easy for them to just compromise and fit in. For the Christian, that's the same danger that we have today. When we spend more time at church, when we spend more time in fellowship with the saints, we are constantly reminded of the blessings of God. Amen. Amen. However, when we choose to separate ourselves from godly influences around us, we are placing ourselves in a dangerous position. The more we stay away from godly influence, the easier it is to compromise our faith. Therefore, it is essential that we surround ourselves with God's people every time we get a chance. Every time there's an opportunity, we should be excited about the fellowship of the saints. See, we need to stay fueled up because it's so easy to fall up. Amen, somebody. We need to be in some good company because it's a whole lot of bad company out there in the world. See, it takes practice to be a conqueror. But it don't take nothing to be a compromiser. Takes nothing. No effort. So we need to come to church. We need to read our Bibles. We need to come to fellowship so we can continue to have that process embedded in our minds. These young men were forced away from their home and they were forced away from their spiritual comfort and they were forced to live in a land of heathenistic discomfort. So notice what the Bible says in verse 3 and 4. The text says, and the king spoke to Asphanas, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel to the king's season, to the princes. Children who would have no blemish, but well favored, skillful in all wisdom, cunning in knowledge, understanding science, had such had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach in the learning in the tongue of the Chaldeans. First, we recognize they had a new home. Well. Now, guess what? They're trying to teach them some new knowledge. Yeah. See? These young men were taught a new language. They were taught a new way of looking at life. All their lives, they've been exposed to Jewish wisdom. Now they are being taught the wisdom of the Babylonians. The classical literature of the Babylonians was a complicated syllabic style of writing. The language that was spoken in the multiracial uh, uh, Babylonia was, was Aramaic. And they were being exposed to things that they had never been exposed to before. It's a dangerous time for them, y'all. There's a lot of pressure being exerted on these young men for them to conform in this new world that's around them. As they observe their new surroundings, somewhere, somewhere in their minds, they have concluded that they were not raised like that and they were not brought up like that. Somewhere in their minds they said, no, I can't compromise. I can't conform to this because I wasn't raised like that. The same dangers face the Christian in the world today. We are constantly exposed to all these new ways of thinking. And of being told that we, the way that we look at the world through the eyes of God and the Bible is, is outdated. The way that we look at the world is, is ancient and is intolerant. We are told to accept homosexuality. We are told to accept alcohol usage and oh, everybody curses. And we are told that promiscuous uh, sexual activity is all right. That's what they're telling us. And they expect us to accept that. They expect us to conform to that. They expect us to compromise. But somewhere in our minds, we need to conclude that my father didn't raise me like that. Somewhere in our minds, we need to decide and conclude that I wasn't spiritually brought up like that. An important part of the process of conquering compromise is standing firm on how you were spiritually raised. When someone says, it's all right to get high, it's all right to get drunk, and you just say, my father didn't raise me like that. When, 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 when the world says it's all right to shack up, you just say, my father didn't raise me like that. When the world says, just look out for yourself, just look out for number one, just say, my father didn't raise me like that. 
Well, when the world measures your success based upon possessions, just say, my father didn't raise me like that. No matter how the world changes, my God never changes. Amen. Amen. We need to remember the words of the psalmist when he says, forever, O oh Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Amen. And if it's settled in heaven, it needs to be settled in our hearts. Amen. Amen. So the people of God had a new home, surrounded by new knowledge. And now they're going to be introduced to a new diet. Look at verse number five. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank. So they nourished them for three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. The king is saying, all right, we got these new slaves, y'all. And it was a process that they had to go through before they could work in the palace. So he said to the master eunuchs, listen, feed them and train them and give them, give them what I eat. Give them what I drink. And then bring them to me in three years. And they should be ready. Nice and full and strong. Because there was an expectation in the palace. You had to look a certain way and carry yourself a certain way and be physically a certain way. But all their lives, these four young men, they lived by the dietary standards that was handed down by the law of Moses. Now they are faced with new food. Most likely the food was unclean by Jewish standards. And most of the meat probably was offered uh, to, to sacrifice the idols. Now, I don't know about y'all, but if somebody came here right now and just took us away to Babylon, which I think is the area of Turkey right now, and, and, and they said we can't have fried chicken no more, collard greens no more, cornbread no more. <laughs> oh yeah, it's going to be on, bro. It's going to be a problem. And they put in front of us, I don't know, some barbecue giraffe knees or something crazy. I don't know, some orangutan toes. I don't know. And this is your diet. This is what you got to eat. No more chitlins. Oh, y'all don't like chitlins. Uh, yeah, y'all shaking your head like, this is what they had to go through. No more oxtails, rice and peas. <laughs> That's what, what? Oh, I knew I was going to strike somebody. Uh-huh. I can't imagine what they had to go through. A new home. I got to learn all this new stuff. And now you want me to eat your food. Those four boys didn't want to compromise. Therefore, they said, listen, we don't want to eat this stuff because it's going to defile us. As Christians, we are faced with choices that run contrary to the world, y'all. We are faced with things that run contrary to, to God's law and the purpose that he has for us. There are decisions we got to make about our entertainment, y'all. The world is saying, oh, this is some good entertainment. May not be good for you. There are some decisions we need to make about the music that we listen to, the music we watch. There are some decisions we need to make about the people we spend a lot of time with. And just like how they didn't want to be defiled by eating that food, we need to say no to some of the things that are around us so we don't become defiled by what we watch, by what we listen to, by the people we hang out with. It can defile us. And somebody said, oh, Brother Jones, I got to go to work. I got to go to school. How am I not going to be around people? God understands that. He calls for us to be in the world, but not of the world. Amen. And when you're in the world, you be the influence. You set the tone. Amen. Too much of their stuff is seeping into our stuff. And so that's why we got to learn this process of conquering compromise. No, don't be ashamed of your faith. Amen. Amen. You stand strong on your spiritual convictions. We are confronted by daily choices uh, to do or not do certain things that can defile us. Therefore, it is extremely important that we be on guard. Guard ourselves and, and so we can watch out for our lives. The psalmist said in Psalms 101, verses 3 and 4, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. Then he went on to say, I hate the works of those that have fallen away. It shall not cling to me. A perverse heart shall depart from me. I will not know this wickedness. Since we are conquerors of compromise, we don't want to see it. We don't want to do it. We don't want to know it. Why? Because we can't stand it. 
We need to be just like the psalmist. I don't want no parts of it. So the king said, give them the best. Let them eat what I eat. Let them drink what I drink. And this way, they can be trained to serve me. Well, listen, the devil's saying the same thing today. Let them have the world's best. Let them feast on what the world has to offer so they can best serve me. That's what the devil is saying. I'm going to dress this thing up. I'm going to make it look like gold. And I want y'all to take this and have all you want. It's a smorgasbord, all you can eat. And the more you feast on the world, the more you can serve me. Church, I'm going to tell you that conforming is compromise. And compromise is conforming. Remember, a compromise is a settlement of differences by mutual concessions. Remember, a compromise is an agreement reached by an adjustment of conflicting or opposing claims of principles. Too many, too many of God's people are making deals with the devil. Too many of God's people are making agreements with the adversary. Too many of God's people are making settlements with Satan, making concessions with the creature, coming to terms with terror, working things out with the wicked one, too laid back when it comes to Lucifer, compromise Christ for the enemy of the cross. Too many of God's people are compromising the cross of Jesus Christ. It's time to put on the whole armor of God. Be strong in the Lord and be conquerors of compromise as we journey towards heaven's shores. Amen. Somebody need to stand up and be strong in the Lord. Yes. And that's what he's looking for today. Conquerors of compromise. Yes. So verse 6 and 7 goes on to say, Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Unto whom the prince of the eunuch gave names. For he gave unto Daniel the name Belteshah. Unto Hananiah of Shadrach. Unto Mishael of Meshach. And unto Azariah of Abednego. We have witnessed several problems at hand this morning. We have witnessed that they have a new home. We have witnessed the new knowledge. We have witnessed a new diet. And Lord have mercy, now they got to deal with a new name. The Babylonians gave their captives new names to emphasize their new relationship with Babylon and to cut ties with their former religion and former country. Y'all remember Roots? And when Kuta Kente had a strong name, meant something, got him over here and stopped calling him Toby. Took his name away. Listen, these men had names that was associated with God. Daniel, in Hebrew literature, it means God is my judge. But they gave him a name called Belteshah, which means Baal's prince, or Baal will protect. Remember, Baal was the false god of fertility in nature, and they worshipped Baal all day and all night long, gave kids unto it, sacrifices unto it, and they made Daniel the chief prince whose name was after Belteshah, the prince of Baal. From God is my judge to the prince of a false god. And then they looked at Hananiah and said, oh, yes, bring Hananiah in here. In Hebrew language, Hananiah means Yahweh is gracious. His name means God is good. But they changed his name to Shadrach. Shadrach is the God of the sun. And then they said, all right, bring Mishael in here. Mishael, in Hebrew terms, it means there is nobody equal with God. Ain't nobody like God. Don't nobody come close to God. That's what Mishael means. But they changed his name to Meshach, which means Aku. Aku is the, is the God of the moon. Oh, you got one more and they bring him in here. Azariah. Azariah means Yahweh is my help. It means God is my strength. It means God is my fortress. It means God is my everything. And they took him and said, now your name is Abednego. And that means the servant of Nebo. 
Nebo is the God of fire. He's not even named after that. He's the servant of the God of Nebo. They had to deal with a new home, new knowledge, new food, and now these deplorable new names. They are now demoted to the leading gods of Babylon. How degrading and deplorable that must have been. And don't you know, church, don't you know that when we compromise, we change our name. We change our name. Yes, we do. Preacher, what do you mean we change our name? That's a good question. I'm glad you asked. We do the name Christian. No justice when we conform and compromise. No justice. Nobody don't even know who you are when you compromise. The world doesn't see that name. Heaven doesn't see that name. The Holy Spirit doesn't see that name. Jesus doesn't see that name. God doesn't see that name. For when we compromise, we denounce our royal status in the kingdom. You just says, I don't want to be royal no more. See, names are important. Amen. Means everything. Yeah. Way too much is at stake when we want to do what we want to do. Mm. Way too much has been sacrificed for us to do what we want to do. We must always remember the process of conquering compromise. Because the consequences are so severe. Listen, Joseph didn't compromise when he was being seduced by the queen. He didn't give her an inch. He didn't say, all right, Pharaoh's wife, I'll come in your room for a little while. We could just kiss, and that's it, and I'm leaving. Mwah. And I'm out. Yeah, right. You can't play with compromise. Don't get that thing to itch. He ran. Yeah. John the Baptist didn't compromise. When he told, uh, 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 who was it, Herod, then leave Herodias alone. That's your sister-in-law. Stop messing with her. So what? Chop my head off. Can't play with this thing. Joshua didn't compromise when he came back with a good report. Man, you know what? Yeah, there's some big dudes over there. But you know, I, I, we might be able to take them, I think. Maybe we just take the east side of Canaan and just give them the rest. No. He said, let's go kick them behind. Let's go. But, but they're bigger than us. So what? Our God is bigger than them. Go no compromise. Joshua did not compromise. Noah didn't compromise. Listen, God told him to use gopher wood. You out in the wilderness, it's pine trees, oak trees, cherry trees, red trees, apple trees, peach trees, all these trees. And I had to go through the forest and find gopher wood. Oh, that man, I ain't seen a gopher tree in weeks. Let me, oh, there's the one over there. No, you know, I could compromise and use this. He didn't compromise. God said gopher wood, that's what he used. Elijah didn't compromise up on Mount Carmel. 450 prophets of Baal on one side, God folk on the other side. Who are you going to choose this day? Paul didn't compromise when uh, uh, Peter got two faced down there in Antioch. Went down there and was hanging out with the Gentiles, having pork chops and ribs. And here come James and the other brothers from Jerusalem. He's like, oh, snap, here come the brothers. Hey, brothers, what's up? What's going on? Hey, how y'all doing? The Gentiles over there still eating pork chops. He's wiping around. Ah, what's up, fellas? <laughs> Paul withstood him to his face. Even Barnabas got caught up in that nonsense. And, and Peter was still, man, Paul said, man, what is wrong with you? And he said it in front of everybody. Did not compromise. Jesus didn't compromise when he went to the cross. He was like, no, nah, Father, I, can't, I ain't dying for these heathens down here. They spitting on me and they nailing stuff in my hands and they don't care nothing about me. They talking about me, trying to throw me off cliffs and he didn't compromise. Take me to the cross. I need to die because I love you. Church, we need to stop giving in so easy. And live up to the name that was given to us. When I was a slave out in the world, I had a slave name. All my name was was Melvin. Didn't mean nothing. Had no substance. Had no meaning. 
Back in the day, I might have thought it meant something because had a little popularity on the radio and everything. I thought it meant something. meant nothing. But I'm so glad that Isaiah looked down the annals of time. And he said in Isaiah 62 and 2, he said, The Gentiles shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory. And you shall be called by a new name. Yes. By the mouth of the Lord that will bestow. Then the church of Christ began in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2. And then the Gentiles got the word somewhere in Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 10. By Acts chapter 11, we're called Christians. Now I have a name that means something. Amen. Means something now. And I'm not going to compromise and give that name up for nothing and nobody. I've been washed in the blood, given a new name. I'm a Christian and a Christian only. Nothing more, nothing less, and nothing else. Amen. Praise be to God. Amen. Nebuchadnezzar's goal was to change their identity and hopefully change their way of thinking. Mm. However, it's plain to see that as one reads the book of Daniel, even though their names were changed and their, char their characters remained intact. Yes. My name is still Melvin, but I got to make sure my Christian character stays intact. Amen. When you read that book of Daniel, you'll see, you'll see that they hung in there. The world and the devil will try every tactic to force us to fit in their mold. But however, no matter what they say to us, no matter what they call us, no matter what they throw at us in life, they'll never be able to change who we are. Never be able to change who we are. In John, 1 John, rather, 1 John and 3, and verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the children of God. Verse 2, he says, Beloved, now we are the children of God. And it has not been yet revealed what we shall be, but we will know when he is revealed, and we shall be like him, and we shall see him like he is. You ain't taking this away from me. I have been called the children of God. This name that I have, the world didn't give it, and the world can't take it away. Amen, somebody. Looking at the stance these four men took there in Babylon will help us face the crossroads of life. They saw the problem at hand, and lastly this morning we'll see the purpose in their heart. Look at verse number 8 of the text as we get ready to come to the landing strip of this sermon. Verse number 8 in our text, the Bible says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine that he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Notice the dedication right there. The Babylonians could change their home, change their diet, change their names, but they could never change their heart. Amen. Never change their heart. Daniel refused the king's food and participating in the perversion of the food. It was customary in the, the king's court for them to pour a little bit of wine on the floor, a little bit of food on the floor for the false idols. It's just like y'all watch TV and brothers out there in the corner drinking, man, this is for a homeboy that died the other day. Let's pour a little bit out on the sidewalk. Same concept. If Daniel and his three friends would have partaken in the food, it would have been a direct violation of God's law. Daniel purposed in his heart not to do wrong. The New American Standard says he made up his mind not to defile himself. Church, what about us? What about us this morning? What have we purposed in our hearts? What have we made up in our minds? Let me ask another question. Let's, let's, let's just amplify that just a little bit more. When was the last time you purposed in your heart something from a spiritual standpoint? When was the last time you just said and made up your mind that I'm going to do this for the Lord? I'm going to do this for the kingdom. When was the last time you purposed something in your heart? Have we purposed in our hearts to conform to the world or conform to the comforter? Have we purposed in our minds to serve sin or to serve the Savior? Have we purposed in our heart to follow the crowd or to follow Christ? Have we made up in our minds to love riches or to love the Redeemer? Have we made up in our minds to focus all your energy on your career or on the cross? Have we purposed in our hearts to follow the flow instead of following the Father? What have you purposed in your mind? 
What have you decided to do? Where are your affections set this morning? What is it, y'all, that has all of your attention? What is it that consumes all your energy? What is your mind always focused on? What are the true desires of your heart? You know, God knows. Then he made up his mind that no matter what they could, no matter what they did, he was not going to disobey God. Although he was in a strange land, eating strange food with strange rules, the law of God was not strange. And he clung to it with all his heart and all his might. And notice the disposition of Daniel. He requested to ask the chief eunuch not to defile himself. He didn't demand or command. He didn't catch an attitude. He didn't cause no drama. He didn't say, man, I ain't eating this. Come on, parents. Some of y'all kids say, no, I don't want to eat this. <laughs> Grow up like I grew up, you're just going to sit at the table and eat it or be hungry. I'm not making chicken nuggets. They didn't even have chicken nuggets when I was growing up. <laughs> there was only one McDonald's in the whole greater half of there. That was a treat. No, we ain't going to McDonald's. Your room ain't clean. But what about us? See, we live in a strange land, and there's some rules that we need to abide by. Listen, when we receive our job description and we look at our whole lineup of what we have to do, there's always some little small print at the bottom that says, and other related duties. And so when the boss says, oh, you got to do this, what we could, ah, that ain't my job. But remember who you're working for. Notice Daniel's disposition. Young folk. When your teacher or your parents ask you to do something. Amen. When an adult asks you to do something. Amen. Just do it. Amen. Oh, parents, I thought I was going to have y'all with me right there. Amen. Yeah, the kids looking at me like, Pfft. Adults ain't going to tell you to do nothing crazy and far-fetched. It's trying to teach you some discipline. Amen. It may not be your turn for the dishes, but do them anyway. So what? You took the garbage out the last five times. It's running over. Take it out again. Amen. Thank you, parents. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. When an adult asks you to do something, just do it. Yes. But we quick to say, I need some new sneakers. I need this. I need that. I need a cell phone. I need a laptop. I need a bike. Wow. I need some new clothes. I need some Jordans. I need FUBU. Oh, FUBU. Is that still in style? <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Oops, sorry about that. Leave it to Oh, Lord. I don't even know what y'all were. <laughs> Did I say Jordan? <laughs> Whoever laughing, y'all all. <laughs> Sassu. <laughs> but y'all know what I'm talking about. The kids always got to wear this. I heard they got jeans out there for $300. Hoodies for 200 That's insane to me. But our kids want that stuff. And look at they warm. And we go out and get it. And look at they warm. A mess. Sorry, young people. I'm just trying to help y'all. Y'all might disagree right now. But trust me, when y'all get to college, when y'all get to the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine, Job Corps, when you get out on your own, you're going to say, yes, Brother Jones, I'm glad you said that. I ain't never understand none of that stuff till I became an adult. I used to think my mother... She t I'm on a tangent right now. I'm almost done. Boy, wash the dishes before you go to bed at night. I'm going to work. I'm in the bed, knocked out. My mother come busting her room like Wonder Woman. Boom! She want me to wake up from the sound of her coming in my room. Boy, get your bleepity bleep. Wash them dishes now. It's late at night. Sink full of dishes. And I had to wash them. That night, amen somebody. Guess what? The next day when my mother told me to wash them dishes before going to bed, them dishes was washed, clean, dried, and put up. Messing around. I love y'all young people. I love y'all. But, but, but we, uh, we, our chores, we, we, we got to do our chores. Help all around the house. Mom and daddy work too hard to work and come home and have to do that. That's a whole other sermon, but I'm way out there. But I just had to drop that by. Thank you, Holy Spirit. That ain't even a part of the lesson. But do what your parents tell you to do. I'm telling you, you'll be better off. Listen, an A student that got a bad attitude, nobody want to be bothered with him. 
but you could be a C student with a great attitude, man. People will go out there way for you. Amen. Daniel had a calm disposition in the palace. He said to the eunuchs, if you don't mind, I'd rather not eat what has been served to me. And I ain't going to get into this. It's so much more to this. Y'all read this when y'all get home. Because he later on says, listen, give me and my friends some vegetables and some water. And he says, I guarantee you we're going to look much better than the ones eating the king's food. The eunuch got scared and says, man, y'all going to look all frail and skinny and they're going to cut my head off. No, they won't. Now, listen, trust me on this one. We're going to look good. Man, they ate vegetables and water, man. They was presented before the king. Look more healthy than the ones eating all that stuff that was served to them. Amen. That's a lesson for us to eat right. Amen. <laughs> These men had decided that they was going to serve the Lord, whatever the cost was. It would have been easy to say, well, we could do this because everybody else is doing it. Or we better do what the king says and we can outwardly obey him and just keep our little faith to ourselves. No. No, these options wasn't good enough for these men. No, 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 no. They were willing to commit themselves to God in spite of the consequences. And as you follow them the rest of their lives, you will see that they stuck to their guns. Listen, in chapter 3 of Daniel, you remember Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego was told to bow before this golden image. They said, no, we ain't bowing to this image. You're not going to bow to this image. Nebuchadnezzar said, if you don't bow to this image, I'm going to throw you in a fiery furnace. Some of y'all know the story. Nebuchadnezzar got so mad because they said no in front of the whole court. Nobody says no to the king. King gets mad. He says, turn the furnace up seven times hotter. And the men, while they're throwing the coals and they're throwing the wood, and they got burned up from the heat. Throw them boys in the fiery furnace. Don't want to bow down to my image. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, just fellowship and having a good time. And they looked and they said, Oh, I thought we just threw in three. I see another. And it looks like the Son of God. Learn to conquer the compromise. Keep reading, Daniel. When you get over to chapter 6, Daniel is about 80 years old. And now uh, Babylonia is no longer in power. The, the Medo-Persian army then came and took over. And now Darius is the king. And Darius loved Daniel. Man, there's something about you. He says, I'm going to make you third president over the whole kingdom. I'm going to give you a purple robe and a gold chain. Daniel says, no, your royal highness, I don't. That's all right. I'm good. I don't need any of that. No, 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 I insist. Daniel, a former slave, got clout. So now Darius' his friends that he grew up with, that he gave position to, some of his counselors, some of his military men, looking at Daniel said, you gave this slave, that, man, what in the world? I'm your boy, we, we go way back. How you gonna make him over me? All right, look, fellas, we gotta get rid of Daniel. But what can we do? They couldn't find nothing against his character. Man. Nothing. They couldn't find anything wrong. Like, oh, man, what are we going to do with this guy? Oh, I know what we could do. Guess what I found out? When he's in his chambers three times a day, he looks towards the east and he prays to Jerusalem. Yeah. We could get him with his religion. Hey, Darius, man, guess what? You the man. You the king. When you read the text, they just pumped his head up. Yeah. Oh, live forever, oh king, you the man. So now they got him all pumped up, he juiced up. Be careful when people come to you with all that flattery. It's fine, but just be careful. Daniel, Darius, you the man, we love you, live forever. Guess what? If anybody pray to anybody else or any other God besides you, let's throw him in the lions then. All right, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, we're going to throw him in the lions. I'm the king. All right, just sign this decree. And when you sign a decree, it's irreversible. Sign the decree. Let's go, fellas. We got him. Then you knew about the decree. Then you knew they were setting him up. But guess what? Still went and prayed and faced Jerusalem and prayed to his father. He did not compromise and get scared. He still leaned on the everlasting arms of God. Y'all know the story. They took Daniel and they brought him before the king. And said, we found this with your boy praying to his God. He need to go in the lines. The day is, no, 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 that's my man. You signed it, see? You signed it. So he says, I guess it has to be. 
It can't be reversed. So they threw Daniel on the lions. Then the king couldn't eat, couldn't sleep. All the entertainment he get at night, the women dancing, all the grapes and the food and the wine. He didn't want to do none of that. He just went to his chamber. Bible says the next day, woke up, he looked down in the den. Daniel was right there just petting the lions. Probably named them names and stuff. Probably go fetch. Man, get Daniel out of this lion's den. And those that set him up for so them in the lion's den, and not just them, their wife and their kids. Messing around with my people. He didn't compromise, y'all. When you keep reading this, you'll see that they stuck to their faith. Amen. What about us? Amen. Do we have the same level of resolve and commitment to the Lord and His work? Would you be willing to die for the compromise, or are they willing to die rather than the compromise with the enemy? Probably not. We compromise in many ways. We compromise in our speech, we compromise in our dress, we compromise in our lifestyles. And it's time for us to give that stuff up for the cause of Christ. Amen. They were willing to die. That's a compromise. And some of us not even willing to take ridicule from our surroundings. So we give in. Young people don't conform to all of that nonsense they're doing in school. So what? They call you a nerd or a geek or an outcast. I get it at work. People, they don't invite me to stuff. I'm, you know... Oh, man, you know, Mr. Mr. Bible guy. I take all of that. That's fine. I don't walk around saying, oh, praise the Lord and condemning people. But your righteous lifestyle will expose their unrighteous lifestyle. And you'll get ridiculed. They did it to Peter, James, John, Jesus. So in conclusion, I leave you with this parallel. There was a giant 400-year-old redwood tree. And one day it came crashing down and nobody could not figure out why this tree, this strong redwood, that was about 400, how, why did it just fall? On closer inspection, the investigators found that little tiny beetles had found their way inside the trunk. And these beetles had begun eating their way inside and they started eating away the life-giving fibers of the tree. Weakening it, weakening the mighty bulk from inside out. And after that happened, after the fibers were gone, the tree just fell. In much the same way, the devil tries to bring Christians down through a steady drone of small, seemingly insignificant temptations. While we are fighting and resisting in one area, he's setting up house in another area in our lives. Satan will find a way to creep into the lives of God's children. He will find a way to creep into our lives for the purpose of eroding our foundation. Until our fathers have become undone and then we just come crashing down. Show me a person who has fallen away from their walk with the Lord and I will show you a person who started making compromises in his or her, his or her life a long time ago. Guarantee you. Anybody that fell away, they made a compromise somewhere. If you have begun a downward spiral of compromise, I'm here to tell you this morning that Jesus allows you turns. Amen. Amen, somebody. If you started on a downward spiral, Jesus allows you turns. Yes. And you need to come to him yes. today. He has promised us that we can find unconditional love and unconditional forgiveness when we come to him. Where do you find yourself this morning? If the little beetles of compromise are whittling away with, at your walk with God, then come back home and let the Lord put you in, back where he wants you to be. Will you look deep inside your heart today and find out what you need to do? If so, come to the Lord. Just let the Lord have his way with you today. And come back to the Lord. And learn the process of conquering compromise. Amen. If you're here today and you're not a member of the Church of Christ, don't make no deals with the devil. I don't care what he's telling you right now. The Church of Christ is right. And Jesus is coming back for his church. And you need to be in it so you can be a part of that old ship of Zion. When it's time to go home. 
All you need to do is come and be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. Change your ways and come to Jesus today. There is no appointments that need to be made. No ecclesiastic council is going to vote you in. There's no crazy uh, rituals that you have to just come as you are. Amen. And I guarantee you, you won't leave as you came. Amen. If you're a member of the Church of Christ and you started that downward spiral, you've been compromising and conforming, come back to Jesus today. The inward man is renewed every day. Yes. And that's the beauty of coming to Christ. That's the beauty of being in church. You can be renewed today. Yes. By repenting of your sins, like I always say, we don't need to know all your business. Just ask for prayer. But you just make that change in your life. So that when Jesus comes back again, he can say, well done. Well done. Thou good and faithful servant. Let us all strive to keep in our minds the process of conquering compromise. Is in my veins, Lord, in my veins, yes, it's in my veins.